You are listening to the History of Aviation podcast with Derek Beeler, David Rowe, and David Gorman. All right, well, welcome everybody to the History of Aviation podcast for episode number 17. We got a great plane for you. And as well, thanks for listening to the podcast. Uh, we definitely are growing and we're very happy about that. And as always, I'm joined by Mr. David Rowe and Dave <clears throat> Gorman. How are you guys doing? Starting with you, David Rowe. I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. It's been a, a good couple of days here. Had some really good uh, flyovers. Did a E3 today and a couple of uh, helicopters. And so been been outside looking up for a change. Uh, the weather's finally uh, behaving itself. So uh, enjoying that. And uh, I have to brag on my daughter. We, uh, uh, we had a, a student art exhibition last night uh, at her uh, uh, ETSU college, and she won the drawing award. So uh, we uh, enjoyed that evening last night watching her uh, uh, her drawing skills be recognized. So good couple of days here. Good deal. Dave Gorman. Well, that's uh, that's awesome. Glad to hear about all her talents. I know you had to be very proud of her. Very much so. Good. Well, things here are good. We're um, uh I've been taking pictures more of birds lately than airplanes. Um, got some hawks that are really active around my school, and we were outside for quite a bit today. And so I got pictures of hawks and, and some falcons that were uh, kind of chasing each other through the sky. Kind of neat to see. Big, broad wings and everything. Uh, but everything else is going pretty well. Looking forward to talking about another uh, fantastic, incredible plane, and one that uh, we're really lucky to be able to see so close to us. Here in East Tennessee, we have one that flies regularly. So uh, the Sky Raider, a great one. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's key right there. Is, uh, as a matter of fact, I was going back uh, looking through my Aerofile YouTube channel, and I've got videos of that uh, Tennessee Museum of Aviation Sky Raider going back 12 years. Uh, so I've got some really old videos of us visiting the museum and watching this plane fly. Uh, it's a really great airplane. Uh, it's big and strong, uh, looks good, sounds good. Uh, it's kind of a big brute. Uh, it's a hulk of an airplane, uh, carries a whole lot of weight. And uh, we've actually got some sound bite here. So uh, let's take a listen to uh, the Sky Raider uh, starting up and taking off. <laughs> Sounds impressive. And again, like I said, we're lucky that we can see and hear one uh, in the East Tennessee area on a, on a somewhat regular basis. So beautiful aircraft. This plane was originally designed uh, for the Navy. Is that correct? Yes, it was. Uh, an interesting story about that. Uh, Douglas is the company that uh, built this aircraft. And uh, Ed Heineman was having meetings with the Navy regarding an earlier version of this plane called the Destroyer. And uh, there were some other competing aircraft that uh, were better. Uh, it's called the Mauler. And so he just said, well, let's forget about the Destroyer. We're going to show you a brand new plane tomorrow morning. And he and two designers went back to a hotel overnight. And, you know, based on their knowledge, they sketched out the Sky Raider design, went back the next morning and showed the Navy brass and said, this is what we want to build for you, the Sky Raider. And the Navy looked at it and said, well, you've got nine months. Build it and uh, let us see it because we like the design. And it took nine months and one day, and they had a Sky Raider flying. And uh, the rest is history from that point. You know, it, it came out at a time when uh, the world was moving to, to jet aviation. You know, it was late World War II. Uh, when it was designed, it didn't see service in World War II. It was available for Korea, but... You know, there was so much uh, attention and excitement and money uh, that was being paid towards uh, jet aviation. And so this plane was kind of an anachronism in a way that it was uh, uh, that it survived all that change and uh, survived to perform admirably in the Korean War for the U.S. Navy and then uh, again into the Vietnam War and some other nations. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, one of the great, uh, it's, it's literally one of the most versatile airplanes ever built. 
uh, you know, started out in 1946. Like you said, it was a remnant of World War II prop, big and powerful, and everybody's looking at the jets, but this plane could do things that the jets couldn't do. It could fly low, slow. It could hang around for hours on end, and it made it a platform that the jets just weren't quite ready to uh, to master yet. It would be a few years down the road when another r rather famous airplane called the Warthog came along to uh, kind of fill the gap that the Sky Raider left behind. Much the same mission, right? Exactly. Ground Just attack. A big, a big flying tank that had uh, lots of hard points and could uh, could take a beating. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, the Sky Raider had 15 hard points underneath its wings. Uh, it's, it's really a bomber, but it has no bomb bay. All of the uh, bombs that it could carry, and at the time it was designed, it could carry all the weapons in the arsenal, all the bombs, rockets, Whatever they had, it could carry, and it carried them on the wings, which is pretty amazing. It you know, slung everything out in the air and uh, went to battle with it. You know, when I, when I was reading about uh, Ed Heinemann's involvement, uh, you know, I mean, he's one of those fantastic, well-known, famous aircraft designers. He did the, the Skyhawk. Uh, you know, having a guy like that was, you know, kind of like Kelly Johnson, a guy that could just visualize something that, could fly. He just understood uh, the the dimensions and the drafting and the uh, you know what it took. Uh, but I read that he didn't think about a future design for the engine. He thought, well, I'm going to design something around the biggest engine, the best engine I, that we have. Uh, and sometimes you hear about planes that kind of get stranded in their design because they're reaching towards a uh, an engine that hasn't quite been perfected yet. But that's not true with Sky Raider. It, it had that big engine in front and uh, was ready to go from day one, basically. Uh, exactly. It's the same engine that uh, powered the B-29 Super Fortress. Uh, it was also the same engine that flew the Constellation, uh, the passenger airliner. Uh, so, yes, it was a well-developed, well-understood engine. And so there wasn't a, a, a long development period to get it working. It was pretty much ready to go. And uh, it's a pretty powerful engine, you know, a right uh, 3350. So it's got a lot of power built in. I was reading some about uh, the design. You mentioned the XBT-2 D1, that, that first, uh, the Destroyer, I think it was called. Correct, the Destroyer. And, uh, you know, they had they had a pretty good design that they were working on, but uh, they wanted to see if they could save any weight on it. And so, uh, you know, they realized that if they could uh, take some weight off of that plane, it could fly faster and, and loiter longer and all that kind of stuff. And they began to uh, uh, change the fuel system, uh, got rid of the external bomb or the internal bomb bay, like you said, uh, used a fuselage dive brake. Um, a, a different tailwheel design, all these types of things. They saved 1,800 pounds of weight and, uh, and you know, improved the performance of that plane. And so they applied some of those lessons to the Sky Raider um, as well. So they, you know, they're already thinking about you know, how do we uh, make the best, fastest, uh, longest loitering uh, hard point you know, uh, loaded up aircraft for, for all these roles that, that it excelled in. And, um, you know, they were definitely up to the task. Well, this is the culmination of the single engine piston powered aircraft uh, for military use. Uh, I mean, they took all of that knowledge from all of World War II and before and put it into this aircraft. And, you know, they created a, an absolute winner. Uh, and speaking of the lightning taking out all the weight that they could, that actually created a few problems later in life where there were some stress fractures and some, you know, areas where they had to go back in and re-beef it up because, you know, slamming that plane down on a carrier deck, that's a really hard thing on an airplane. And so they, some of that lightning had to be reversed in order to beef it up to survive the landing. And I also read that the pilots had to alter their landing the way they did it a little bit to help the longevity of the aircraft so uh you know that it was absolutely necessary to make it as light as possible but to keep it strong you have to you know beef it up as well 
Well, now, and I, if I understand correctly, as we mentioned at the opening, this was or originally designed for the U.S. Navy. So were all Sky Raiders built for the Navy, therefore with a tail hook? Uh, yes, I because that's, the, I th the Air Force took them from the Navy, I believe, is how that works. Yeah. So, yes, they should, unless the Air Force took them off. The, the planes that the Air Force got were originally from the Navy. So that's why you see a tail hook on Lieutenant America, for example. Correct. Exactly. So, I got to believe if you're flying a plane like this, you know, having that big engine out in front of you uh, has got to got to help. You know, you, you feel you, you got a little bit of metal to hide behind. But they also did some armor plating around the cockpit, too. Right. Yes, it, it was very heavily armored for the pilot's protection. Uh, it was an extremely tough airplane. Uh, could take a lot of battle damage. Uh, I was listening to one pilot talk about there were four Sky Raiders and a couple of bird dogs that had gone out for a mission. And when they came back and landed, they counted over 600 holes in the six aircraft. So, I mean, they were capable of taking a lot of hits and, and bringing the pilots home. That's incredible. Yeah. Man. And, you know, I, I always laugh when you hear some of the uh, ways that this this plane was called a SPAD, uh, you know, as pilots of other faster jets would uh, would sometimes demean the uh, the pilots of a Sky Raider and, and called it a SPAD, which was the French World War One aircraft. They were talking about it being so slow. But my gosh, um, I, I've had the opportunity to meet a few Sky Raider pilots. They absolutely love this plane they love the missions they love the the platforms they loved all the uh the things they could carry and, and as we keep talking about it's loiter time The this plane was involved in a lot of uh low to the ground uh strafing and, and protecting the troops who were being in danger of being overrun or helping to uh coordinate the rescue of other pilots uh down pilots and, and air crewmen um, it really played a, a major role and a very human role in, uh, in the Vietnam War. But uh, originally it was uh, serving the Navy in Korea. Uh, and did I read it actually shot down a MiG? Sky Raider uh, pilot shot down a MiG? Well, uh, not in Korea. I think that was, was that Vietnam? I'm trying to remember which one it was because I think uh, Korea, they shot down a uh, Soviet built uh, PO2 biplane is what my notes say. Uh, Major George Lenomir and uh, uh, he shot down a Soviet built uh, Polycar Polycar Pol Whew. Polycarpov PO2 biplane. The only documented Sky Raider victory of Korea. That yeah, that's right. It was they got I think they got a MIG or two in Vietnam, but yes. Yes, uh, that's this wasn't an air to air platform, really, was it? Sky no. Raider really wasn't designed for that kind of thing. It was not designed for that, but it was very maneuverable and could go into that realm if necessary. Uh, but yes, it was not designed to be a, a, a sleek, pretty fighter. It's if you look at it, it's big. Big flat sides, thick, you know, it looks heavy, you know, not streamlined. It's not a Spitfire. Uh, so you, uh, you you get what you see. It's it's heavy. It's hard. Uh, speaking of names, you were talking about the different names that they had called it. Uh, it had a bunch. Uh, some of the more popular ones was the Able Dog. Uh, one of the things we haven't talked about is this plane had multiple names. It started out as the Destroyer. Uh, then it became the AD-1, uh, so they called that plane the Able Dog, and when the military decided to consolidate all of the names of aircraft, it became the A-1 uh, Sky Raider. Uh, so some other names, uh, the Sandy, when it was doing search and rescue, uh, flying dump truck, uh, there's actually a, a two-place uh, tandem seating aircraft they called that one the fat face for obvious reasons because it's much thicker and fatter and the vietnamese south vietnamese had a really interesting name crazy water buffalo <laughs> wow well that's pretty evocative but uh you know gives you an idea of maybe the missions that it flew for them as well 
Yes. Uh, well, let's and there, speaking there of were, mission, there, there were Vietnam, uh, South Vietnamese pilots that flew the, the Sky Raider. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, Vietnam started and ended with the Vietnam pilots flying the aircraft. So we supplied South Vietnam with the Sky Raiders uh, before we were involved. Uh, we had pilots over there showing them how to fly and probably taking part in some of the flights that they were doing. And then as we were ending the war and trying to get out, we left Sky Raiders in the uh, South Vietnamese hands and they finished the war fighting with the Sky Raiders. And, uh, you know, we've uh, one of the reasons we have the Tennessee Museum of Aviation has a Sky Raider is because one of those Sky Raiders was left in uh, Vietnam and uh, some uh, very uh, bold pilots went and picked them up. Uh, and brought them home. Uh, Roger Youngblood and uh, Mr. Drummond flew four uh, Sky Raiders out of Vietnam back into Thailand and literally saved them, uh, combat veterans. Uh, so there's, there are four of them that they got, and they're still out there and still flying today, which is pretty amazing. Tennessee Museum of Aviation's got one. Cavanaugh Flight Museum in Addison, Texas has one. Uh, the National Air and Space Museum in D.C. has one, and the Colorado Springs Museum of uh, World War II Aviation has one. So four combat veterans saved by uh, Roger Br uh, Youngblood and Drummond. Goodness gracious. And we've had uh, Youngblood, and I think Drummond has also been in, in uh, Sevierville uh, for presentations to, to recognize uh, their efforts to save those planes and get them to safety. Uh, and also some of the missions that highlight some of the missions that these guys flew in Vietnam, some hairy, hairy stuff. Um, and, you know, there are not a lot of World War II pilots around to tell us of their exploits and one to one conversations or presentations. It's uh, it's happening with Vietnam veterans as well. And um, although it's been a few years since we've had a presentation in Sevierville, hopefully they'll be able to get these guys back again. The Alpha Alpha group that's. Uh, shared some of their stories of pretty harrowing missions, but boy, oh boy, those guys had a, a great sense of camaraderie and uh, unit cohesion and patriotism. They're, they're fantastic men and uh, deserve all the honor and praise that we could give them. Yeah. A hundred percent agree with that. They, uh, they really, uh, they put in the work and uh, you know, they, they partied hard and they, they fought hard and it shows those, those Sky Raider reunions are just amazing. There's, there's some uh, videos out there. Our, our friend Bruce sent me a link to one and uh, I was watching through it. And one of the pilots, a, a wind deporter was talking about, uh, he actually wrecked two Sky Raiders in one day. Uh, and this is indicative <laughs> of the type of flying that the Sky Raider does. Uh, he was out on a mission and there was somebody trying to, you know, help some troops and was dropping white phosphorus and, you know, they weren't hitting the target. And so he went in with napalm, got really low, flew through the, the white phosphorus smoke, dropped his napalm on target. And when he pulled out, he met some trees, tore up his airplane a little bit, but he got it back to the base, got out later that day. He went back out much the same thing supporting some troops got too low flew through some smoke and then he really smacked a tree flew it back and that plane never flew again he had to put it into a, a scrap yard <laughs> and uh, so he killed two two sky raiders in one day and uh and interesting in this in the video later on he's talking about another accident he had later where two of the sky raiders collided and one of the other sky raider pilots made the joke well you just need two more and you're an ace win <laughs> some good natured ribbing is always uh always comes in hand well speaking of uh, other funny stories um david you have a picture behind you on your screen that we could see of uh, some rather interesting ordnance <laughs> yes uh one of the most interesting stories about the sky raider is uh they dropped a toilet bowl on north vietnam uh <laughs> one of the last flights of a cruise, uh, 1965, a uh, Commander Clarence Stoddard, uh, VA-25, was the uh, XO flying a, an A-1H Sky Raider, Paper Tiger II. And uh, 
they had an extra broken toilet and they decided let's drop it on the, on the North Vietnamese. So they made a rack, they put tail fins and a nose fuse on it and <laughs> they, they attached it to one of the pylons. Well, while they were doing this, they did it back and hid it so that the commander of the ship could not see it. So there were a lot of people involved. They hid it. They got it on to the cat to launch. And just as the plane is starting to take off, the uh, captain of the ship looks down and he's like, uh, what the hell was that on 572's right wing? And then too late, the plane's gone. So the other interesting part is once they got to the target, uh, Commander Stoddard was going in and with his wingman and he dropped that toilet bowl. Well, it fell forward and the, the bowl part caught the wind and went flipping backwards and almost took out his wingman. It was that close. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> and well, uh, seemed, so, seemed like a good idea at the time. Well, exactly. It was funny. Uh, they, they called it the, uh, was codenamed Santa Flush. And uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so, yes, that, that's one of the more uh, fun stories of uh, the toilet bomb that the Sky Raider dropped. That's, I don't know how many people can say that. You know, we've had bazookas on uh, little small airplanes, but this was a toilet bowl dropped on the enemy. I'm glad it was commemorated with the picture. And uh, as we were talking before the show, there was a, a model kit that I've seen where you can build that particular plane, Paper Tiger 2, uh, complete with toilet bowl. bowl. So um, pretty fascinating stuff. Uh, yeah. But uh, let's talk about conventional. Um, what would a conventional load look like? Uh, how much and, and what kind of things might a Sky Raider uh, have under its wings? Which, by the way, fold because it was designed to fit on carriers. And uh, that's a really uh, cool treat to see in Sevierville or other places with a Sky Raider that's taxing and folding or unfolding its wings. But uh, what would they put underneath there? Well, it, uh, it came attached with uh, four 20, mil 20 millimeter cannons. Uh, I think they held 200 rounds each. So you had about 800 rounds uh, or a two, four, 400 rounds. I doubled it up there. Uh, anyway, uh, cannons. Uh, so could hold up to about 10,000 pounds of bombs. Bombs, rockets, cluster munitions, gun pods, flares, napalm, uh, white phosphorus, extra fuel, uh, any assortment of that with 15 hard points, uh, literally whatever you wanted. The outer hard points were typically uh, little rockets or smaller bombs. The heavy stuff, the wet stuff was all uh, inside the wheels and underneath the uh, fuselage. Including toilet bowl, bowls. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Yeah. So um, there, was, there were losses, of course, and this plane, due to the nature of its mission, was low and slow. And, and down there were the, where the guys were, you know, protecting them, flying overhead and helping to coordinate rescues and things like that. But there were losses. Um, and uh, how many, there was, was there more than one Medal of Honor that was earned by a pilot Flying the Sky Raider or just the one? No, there were actually two, uh, two Medal of Honors. Uh, let me see where my note is. Uh, yes, uh, the, there is one Sky Raider that is, is at, in Dayton, Ohio at the Air Force Museum. That is the Medal of Honor aircraft that uh, Major Bernard Fisher flew in March of 66. Uh, he flew in and rescued another major, uh, Jump Myers, in a, in a Aishaw Special Forces camp. Uh, so he went in, picked him up, flew him back home, earned the Medal of Honor for it. And that aircraft you can actually see at the museum. Uh, the second one was a Colonel William A. Jones III, who uh, did a 1968 mission. Uh, so he was, flew in, uh, had massive damage to his aircraft. Uh, his plane was on fire. He, he was seriously burned. But he returned to base and reported the position of a downed U.S. airman so that they could go back and, and get him. So two Medal of Honors in the Sky Raider. That's an incredible record. Again, uh, with that mission, you were bound to be taking enemy fire most of the time. But uh, some brave, brave pilots and, and a plane that was definitely up to that mission. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, Well, one of the... the 
most famous things that the Sky Raider did were the Sandy missions where they rescued downed pilots. And uh, uh, they literally could hover around the, the wherever that pilot was. And just anytime somebody came in, they could shoot up the area and suppress the fire. So those Jolly Green helicopters could come in. Uh, they called it trolling for fire when they would fly low and try to get somebody to shoot at them so they would reveal their position. They just turn right back around and, you know, shoot them up. So uh, they flew low and slow. Uh, th this is an interesting thing. I had never heard this. Have you ever heard of juicy fruit in relation to <laughs> rescuing a, a pilot? No, sir. Okay. Yes. Uh, you have. Okay. Apparently they, uh, they would drop gas, a knockout gas, uh, around the pilot and to knock out any of the people on the ground or in the tree because usually the pilots would try to hide in trees and if they could and this would knock out the uh the people around so that the helicopter could come in take the the guy down and let him pick up the pilot and get out of there before everybody woke woke up and this was called juicy fruit uh, so they would tell the pilot if you're in a tree strap yourself in because we're dropping some juicy fruit I never heard that. Yeah, that was new to me as well. That's interesting way of uh, getting the job done. Man. And, uh, oh, okay, here, I just saw my note. During the, the Vietnam War, uh, Navy Sky Raiders shot down two North Vietnamese uh, MiG-17s. Uh, June 20th of 65 uh, was uh, Lieutenant Clinton B. Johnson and Lieutenant uh, Charles Hartman. So, yes, two big 17s in Vietnam. Damn. But, uh, really, really a great plane. Uh, I've got a, a couple of personal stories with the uh, Sky Raider myself. Uh, about 10, 12 years ago, uh, the, the Virginia Museum of Aviation sent their Sky Raider down to a... Uh, a little place in Virginia up between Marion and Withville, Virginia, about an hour from where I live. It was a little small fly-in, and I drove up there just to see what shows up, and they have a Sky Raider sitting there. And so I got to talking to the pilot, and he was like, well, you want to sit in it? So I was able to climb into the Sky Raider and sit in the cockpit for about five or ten minutes, take some pictures. Uh, it was a wonderful thing to do. Really appreciate them letting me do that. Uh, got some pictures of me sitting in the cockpit and uh, just loved it. Uh, got out of the airplane, got down to the ground and looked at my pants and I had so much oil and grease on those shorts. <laughs> I have never been able to wear them again. They are completely ruined, but they are covered in Sky Raider juice. Uh, well, so that you was probably you probably had mixed feelings about that. You know, I may I don't know if it was worth it, but, you know, that's that's pretty cool. It was it was very cool. And then the cool part of that, that exact day, I drove from uh, Virginia to the Tennessee Museum of Aviation and saw Lieutenant America fly that day. So I actually saw two Sky Raiders on one Saturday just by driving 100 miles in either direction from me. So that was a really great day. Now, that first one, did you say that was from the Virginia Aviation Museum? Yes. Uh, was it 503? I think that's the one. And that's a uh, dark blue painted Correct. up as the Navy. Yes. Uh, and, and those planes in Korea, uh, that dark blue Sky Raider has a distinction that's kind of kind of cool, too, with something that they dropped. They had a special mission up against a dam, right? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, they, uh, they uh, destroyed a dam that way. Uh, they dropped some, well, I mean, it's a torpedo plane, so. Aerial torpedoes. Yeah. Correct. Uh, something else that's interesting. Did you know the Sky Raider is a nuclear capable bomber? That it can wow. drop nuclear bombs. There was a version that was specifically built to do that. Uh, it wouldn't drop them conventionally like a B-29 would or a B-52. They would do the little toss version where you would zoom in, pull up, release the bomb and immediately turn around and go the opposite direction. So uh, while the bomb was kind of flying up and back down, but nuclear capable, that's another feature <laughs> that, you know, the Sky Raider has extremely versatile. 
Well, you have to you have to believe that those pilots know that they're not going to be scooting out of there that fast. So it's uh, it's a brave man hitting that uh, pickle pin and dropping that bomb. My <laughs> well, goodness. Yeah, I don't know that they ever actually did right. drop the bomb, but it was capable of it. That's you know something you build into it because you don't know you might need it. That's exactly right. They'd practice those flight profiles, wouldn't they? They, they? I'm sure they did a lot of that. So uh, as, as we've been saying, this is one that uh, there is a flying example just up the road from us uh, and down the road for you from from the uh, Tri-Cities area, but up from uh, Knoxville. Uh, and several of these uh, uh, Sky Raiders and various paint schemes fly regularly in the U.S. and, and, and elsewhere, um, which is pretty amazing because this is a this is a 70 year old aircraft, almost 80 years old, right? Correct. Uh, it was built to, uh, starting in 1945, 46 is when they started building it, went into service, I think in 46. They stopped building it in 1957. So roughly 10 years of building. Uh, it flew. Uh, the last known use of the Sky Raider in combat was in about 1979 uh, in Chad. So it flew from 47 to almost 1980. So it flew a long, long time. Goodness. Yes. Well, they <clears throat> here's some trivia for you. They did actually make an appearance in World War II, but in a movie <laughs> that uh, it took me a long time to figure out what I was looking at there. I thought, well, those are strange looking thunderbolts. I bet you know what movie I'm talking about. Uh, the, the longest long, day. The, the longest day. They've got Sky Raiders, a flight of them flying over. And I'm like, look at that thing. What is that? And <laughs> my friend Google helped me with that. So, uh, yeah, the, a lot of questions. There are a lot of movies with uh, the Sky Raider in it. I actually have a list. Uh, the Bridges of Toko Ri, uh, The Green Berets, Flight of the Intruder, uh, We Are Soldiers, uh, Werner Herzog's Rescue Dawn. Uh, and then, like you said, the longest day was a flight of P-47s, which were actually Sky Raiders. So, interesting stuff there. Yeah. Um, I've got a uh, another interesting story. Uh, we've been talking about the Sandy missions that the Sky Raider participated in. Well, I actually met a man that was picked up on one of these missions. Uh, his name is Kenny Wayne Fields. Uh, he wrote a book called Streetcar 304, and uh, I read the book and went and met him at the Hickory Aviation Museum in North Carolina many years ago, and he was actually one of the people, uh, he got shot down in an A-7 Corsair II, and it took them three days. I think this is maybe the longest rescue mission for a downed pilot in Vietnam. Uh, the story he's told is fascinating about evading and contacting the FAC pilots and getting everything arranged so that he can be picked up and the Sandy pilots coming in and clearing out the area. Uh, so I've actually met a man who was rescued during one of these uh, Sandy missions, and he was very appreciative of the Sky Raiders, uh, spoke very fondly of them. Again, it had to be a real comfort at a uh, an awful time for those guys that uh, bailed out or, or crashed, crash landed in the jungle and uh, under enemy fire, sometimes behind lines that uh, uh, maybe they weren't supposed to be behind and knowing that there were you know, people in these aircraft coming in to provide some cover, some support, maybe just talk to them over the radio. Um, the feelings that those veterans have for the Sky Raider pilots are something that um, lifelong and, and deeply felt. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure the, uh, the, the slogan that the, uh, the rescue pilots lived, uh, lived under was that others may live. So, you know, they were putting their life on the line so to make sure that these other people would, would get out alive. And quite literally, that, uh, that they, some did pay the ultimate price trying to go in and rescue or provide, uh, provide protection. Yes, on that uh, streetcar 304, uh, one of the Sky Raider pilots, I think actually two Sky Raiders were shot down. One pilot was rescued. The other pilot was captured and spent the remainder of the war uh, in uh, Vietnam, uh, North Vietnamese uh, possession. Well, now we, we know that uh, this plane saw service with the uh, Republic of South Vietnam um, 
And also you mentioned uh, in the war in Chad in Africa, some other nations that used it uh, include which ones? Uh, France. Uh, let me see. What was that? Uh, I've got an, a list here. Lost it. There were <laughs> several. Yeah, exactly. There's lots of notes here. Oh, here it is. All right. So uh, countries that used the uh, Sky Raider included uh, all three branches of the United States, uh, Air Force, Marine Corps and the Navy, uh, Cambodia, Central African Republic, Chad, France, Gabon, South Vietnam, Thailand, Sweden, the United Kingdom, and ultimately the North Vietnamese used it because they uh, received a few after the end of the Vietnam, Vietnam War. Well, it certainly had some long legs, and it probably was a plane that, uh, again, it, it came out at a time in between, you know, when there was a lot of transition to jets. It proved its value. It served a long, long time. There were probably attempts to remove it from service over the years. And it does kind of remind me of the, the other plane that uh, you mentioned there near the top, Dave, the, uh, the A-10 Thunderbolt, uh, a plane that the Air Force is trying to <laughs> try to get rid of and who knows what uh, when its final demise may come. But uh, we sure are lucky again to have uh, a flying example. And this is a, an aircraft that um, commands and deserves respect. It uh, proved its worth and value over and over again um, in combat. And uh, just, a, just a great plane to see in the air anytime you get a chance. Yeah, or, or actually go to a museum and look at it. Stand next to this thing because it is big. It's tall. I think it's like 12 feet in the air is the tail. Uh, as a matter of fact, that was one of the things I, I didn't really realize is the uh, fat face version of the Sky Raider, the, the two pilots in front, uh, they actually increase the tail by 50%. So if you look at the single seat versus the uh, dual seat, uh, that tail is huge on that plane. So uh, they had to really beef it up to, uh, to handle it. And, and actually, if you go to the Tennessee Museum of Aviation and walk to the back of the aircraft and look at the tail, get right in the center and look right down the, up to the cockpit, you will see that the rudder is angled to the right. Uh, it's not straight. Uh, it's angled to offset the torque of the engine. It's so powerful that even, you know, pushing your rudder pedals in isn't enough. You've got to have built in to the rudder that angle to offset the power of that uh, right 3350. So, wow. yeah, power, lots and lots of power on these aircraft. I mean, it's, it's ultimate, it's the ultimate airplane we're talking about. ground attack. Yep. Sorry. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> about the um, sky here, guy. Uh, starting with you, David. Bro. Uh, well, like I was saying, this is sort of the ultimate attack aircraft of the uh, 50s and 60s and 70s. Uh, it was extremely versatile, uh, very capable aircraft, could do whatever you wanted, was a great flying, a good platform to fight and, and do things. Uh, it... Uh, it's probably the most effective ground support aircraft ever. Uh, the Warthog fans might say differently, but I mean, this plane fought in two different wars and uh, it took about four different aircraft to replace it. Uh, I mean, it, it did anti-submarine warfare, so they had the tracker that came on to replace it. They had the Sky Warrior to do uh, bombing missions. That was to replace it. They had the A-4 Skyhawk to uh, do a light attack. That was a replacement. And ultimately, it was the A-6 Intruder that replaced it. So, I mean, it took four airplanes to replace one. That's how good this plane was. Uh, it's just, you know, it proved itself in an era when everything was trying to be jet-powered. It was the perfect plane at the right time for that gap. And if there's any criticism you can make about the airplane, is they did not build enough of them. Dave Gorman? Boy, that was an excellent summary there. But, uh, you know, this, this is another plane that evokes some emotion in me and some, some feeling, some uh, personal response to it, just seeing, uh, seeing them fly. I think I've got three or four Lieutenant America hats and uh, at least that many shirts. I've got pins and patches. Uh, I sure appreciate 
uh, our friends up in Sevierville at the Tennessee Museum of Aviation, Neil Melton and his whole crew up there uh, hosting and, and maintaining Lieutenant America for people to enjoy. And they, uh, they've brought people here to talk about this plane uh, because it's such a, such a beautiful flying example. Um, I didn't know much about the Sky Raider until I saw this one come to Sevierville. And Dave, you mentioned 10 or 12 years ago, we were all there taking pictures when it was uh, flying for the first time locally and so excited to see it. Now that, that won't ever change. It's been one that uh, has gotten out to some other regional air shows and I'm always proud to, to see it there because uh, people hawk around it. It's got great nose art and uh, people like to uh, you know, get pictures made in front of it and underneath the nose and everything. Just a fantastic aircraft and one that um, uh, is, is legendary and glad to be able to spend some time talking with you guys about it. Yes, wonderful. Great playing. Well, I have got Aerofile, like I was saying earlier. I've got, uh, I think, about 14 or 15 videos of Sky Raiders in my Aerofile YouTube channel. So if you want to see uh, Lieutenant America from the Tennessee Museum of Aviation, there's a bunch of those. And I've got uh, uh, recently went to Atlanta and got some video of the fat face version. So you can see the, uh, the big uh, dual seat uh, version. Uh, and so go check out aerofile.com and uh, see some Sky Raider videos. I was going to say, if I want to see Sky Raider videos, that's where I go. Aerofile. Uh, I, I have to laugh because at one point I was bragging to David that I had a video on my channel that had like 40,000 views. And he's like, oh, that's that's nice. And he <laughs> kindly mentioned that he had some with, you know, well over 10 times as many. Uh, I do have a video of a uh, Sky Raider showing um, <laughs> the, the startup and taxi, and it's it's been pretty popular for a while, uh, our example here in Sevierville. You can uh, look at those videos at Gormania. That's my YouTube channel, um, and uh, some, uh, some aviation content on my Instagram as well, which is underscore it's Dave Gorman. Well, all right, guys. Had a great time. Absolutely. Enjoyed it. Looking forward to the next one. Sure did. We can't wait to do this again next week. Our social media for the show is listed down below. Check all of that out. Uh, so for Dave Gorman, David Rowe, I'm Derek Biller. Thanks for listening to the History of Aviation podcast. This is Joe Morse. You are listening to the History of Aviation podcast with Derek Beeler, David Rowe, and David Gorman.